Good morning? No, afternoon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we are only in the fifth day of the legislative session, the fourth day that we have met on the floor, and I already don't know what time it is, what day it is, what planet I live on, because that's what it's like in the legislative session in our 120-day mad dash to make life better for Coloradans. And um, my, my particular area of interest and why I believe I'm standing here today um, is mental health and specifically youth mental health, but mental health overall. Uh, before I start though, I will say that my dream is to get my PhD at, in the joint program of DU and ILF in religion and social change. Because I believe very strongly that if we're going to look at how do we change social policy, we have to understand and reflect people's faith values. And you know, we have a separation of church and state which has been exceptionally beneficial for my family. I am a Jewish woman whose family um, came here uh, escaping wars, escaping pogroms. We lost 56 members of our family in the Holocaust. I was born in Israel, um, I was, but I was born an American citizen so I could still run for president. I have the birth certificate to prove it. Um, so I saw there was concern on your faces when you heard that I was born in Israel, so I wanted to clear that up. So, um, you know, it's... Right. <laughs> um, so it, for me, there is that recognition that we are people who very often belong to a faith. Whether or not we are practicing that faith, whether or not we go weekly to services or daily to services or three times or five times daily to services, whatever that looks like, this is a integral part of who we are. So when I first started in the legislature, um, which was three years ago, so I'm in my fourth, I just started my fourth session. So I was, I've been elected two times and then I'm, I'm up for election again in November. First day of session, a gentleman gets up, big mustache, you know, cowboy. Um, I didn't know him, Representative Jim Wilson. And he invites everybody to Tuesday morning Bible study. And I'm thinking, this sounds fabulous. And he said, it's open to all, it's, it's inclusive of all, please come down to Bible study. And I'm thinking, well, open to all and inclusive of all, they must be studying the Old Testament. So I show up on the first day and they're studying something called 2 Timothy. Well, I had never heard of a 2 Timothy, and I have a very extensive um, Torah study background. I am a, um, I'm a maven, which is uh, a training that I took to be able to take the weekly Torah portion, the weekly, we read every week a different portion, and create um, interactive performances to engage the community in the reading of that portion so that we understand what it means as it relates to our life now, which 2,500 years ago when they started doing the weekly Torah portion, that's how it was done. And then we got to a very dry version. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm exceptionally well-versed in the Torah. But 2 Timothy, never heard of a 2 Timothy before. Now I understand what 2 Timothy is. We're now studying John. Um, Bible study starts again tomorrow morning. And I will once again immerse myself in studying where I believe values are built from. So many times when I sit in that room, I'm the only Democrat in that room. So it is a room full, uh, and it's an, evangel it's an evangelical Bible study. So the pastor is an evangelical pastor. And my first experience in this type of study, and all of the conversation about Jesus and about what his disciples determined were his trainings and lessons and what we are supposed to take away we're very much like the values that I believe in. And one day, one of the um, House representatives, um, um, why am I blanking on her name? Lori Sane recommended that I read the book of Matthew. And she said that was specifically written for the Jews. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I picked up Matthew and I read Matthew. And let me tell you what I read in Matthew. 
from a Jewish perspective. Good. I heard about a young man who was having a really bad fight with his parents. And you tell me what young man doesn't challenge his parents, especially on faith. When I read that people would be sent to the Sanhedrin, that's what it says in the book of Matthew, the Sanhedrin, like the Sanhedrin is the Jewish court. I do not understand. So anyway, I came back much more confused after reading the book of Matthew, but I have, have been having the most incredible time studying, and yet the values that we discuss in that room change when we get onto the floor for a vote. And I don't understand. So my value is built on the, the concept of tikkun olam, healing the world. It is specifically what I was trained and raised to do. From a very young age, I was taught that our job in the world is to figure out if we see a problem or we see somebody suffering, it is our duty to help them. And when I was 14 years old, I made a promise to myself that I would never complain about a problem unless I was willing to work on the solution. And I have lived my life by that. And the reason I stand in office today is because I got to a problem I couldn't solve without being in public office. My son, when he was nine years old, attempted suicide at school. We knew from the age of six that he struggled with suicidality. I was sitting on the porch, it was a Jewish holiday. I was sitting with my three friends on, the, on one of my friend's back porches because all the kids were in the house. You could hear the noise three blocks away. And my son opens the second story window, he's six at this time, and he opens it and he opens the screen. And he sticks his head out and he says, Mommy, I want to pull out all of my hair and all of my skin until I die. Six-year-olds don't talk like that. No six-year-old I knew ever talked like that. And my girlfriends were shocked. And I was terrified. And I started going down the path. He already had a therapist. You know, dad and I were going through a divorce, right? He already had a therapist. So I went Back to that therapist the very next day, because this was a Saturday, on Sunday, I started calling into the office. On Monday, I still didn't hear back from the doctor. On Tuesday, I worked at Denver Health at this time. I walked over to his office and I knocked on the door and I said, excuse me, I left you a message that my son told me he wants to die and you haven't called me back yet. I feel like this is an emergency. Do you not feel like this is an emergency? And he said, don't worry. Six-year-olds don't die by suicide. And when he said it again at seven, we had an entirely new therapist because that didn't work for me. And that therapist said, don't worry. Seven-year-olds don't die by suicide. And when he was eight with an entirely new therapist, eight-year-olds don't die by suicide. When he was nine, he said, I'll show you. We learned in the hospital that he had had two failed attempts at hanging himself, which he disclosed in the hospital, which we didn't know, that, that he did when he was eight years old. Um, and very interestingly, this young man is, has just completed his college common application after very many months of begging him to write his essay. Um, and he wrote about his suicidality, and I, I didn't think that he would. Um, he still, to this day, says, I wasn't trying to jump out the window. Um, but that, that attempt at that time got him to the hospital where we finally got into the children's hospital system, where we finally started getting him the help that he needed, where we finally learned how extensive his learning disability was. The problem is he's twice exceptional, exceptionally gifted, exceptional learning disability. And there is this part of his brain that doesn't understand why he can comprehend everything he hears but can't get it out of his hand. He can't write it down. He can't take notes in science class and all he wants to do is be an engineer. And I was fighting with the schools, Denver Public Schools at the time, that he was not getting an appropriate IEP evaluation. The IEP that came back said he could spend 80% of his time in school, 
when everybody knew that from the time he was six, he was spending 80% of the time in the office, and he kept getting disciplined, which the hospital clearly told them he should not be disciplined in this way, because anything you say to him, he is turning into an assault against himself. And when he would sit on the floor and bang his head on the floor in classroom, what was the teacher supposed to do? 30 kids in that classroom. You tell me how you would manage it, because I'm sure my son wasn't the only one struggling. So I started to talk to the civil rights attorneys because my son's civil rights were being violated. And it, it, it ate me up inside. The entire idea that I would sue a school system because I knew enough to know that the money wasn't there. I could get a court ruling and they could pay for the private schooling that my son was going to need since they weren't going to give him the experience he needed because they weren't they didn't have it. It wasn't possible. It wasn't there. At the same time, I was volunteering at two of our juvenile correctional facilities, Ridgeview Academy for boys and Betty Marler Juvenile Det Detention Facility for girls. And it was specifically when I was with the boys that I realized, oh my God, these boys are just like my son. Brilliant, brilliant boys that we have locked up. Definitely learning disabilities, without a question. Social skills deficits, absolutely, 100%. I started to look into the stats. 80% of our youth who are incarcerated have at least, at least one diagnosable mental illness. And guess what we do? We put them in jail for it. I learned about a 10-year-old boy, this is already after I was elected, on his third lockup in a detention facility, painting the wall with his feces. This is not criminal behavior. This is serious mental illness. And we don't have the capacity or the knowledge or the desire. I, I don't know what it is. So I couldn't sue, sue the school district. I couldn't do it. But I figured if I was on the other side of the table, maybe I could change some things. My dream, and we passed this bill last year, was to increase the number of social workers in our elementary school system. Unfortunately, it was not passed the way that I wanted it. I wanted it one to 100, but the National Association of Social Workers has put out a number that says one to 250 is the recommended ratio. One to 250, when we look at education, we look at a bell curve all the time, right? We're all familiar with the bell curve. One to 250 is if your kids are up here in the bell curve. Down here, where the other percentage of our kids are, it should be one to 50. One to 50. We don't have the resources in Colorado. I know that, I understand that because let me tell you, ask Anybody on the floor, nobody fights for the money harder than I fight for the money. I sit on the audit committee specifically so I can find where the money is hidden. I know all the hiding places, every single one. And it's not there. So what do we do? This year, I'm asking you to follow a bill and it has a, a number. What's the number of our bill? 1086. HB 20, this is Megan, by the way. Without Megan, I don't get to pass any laws. She's amazing. She runs our entire office, our team of interns, everything. So if you ever need anything, Megan's the go-to over there. So House Bill 20-1086, HB 20-1086. And if you don't know, the easiest way to follow legislation is go to the website leg.colorado.gov. Um, if you specifically want to follow my legislation, just put in D-A-F-N-A. -A. There's no other Daphna in the legislature. So I will come up. It's a terrible picture of me, but trust me, it's me. Um, and you can see all the bills that I'm working on. And there are many in the mental health space. But in the interest of time, I, 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 I wish to share with you my pre-file bill. My pre-file bill is the first bill that I introduced. I consider it the most important bill that I am running this year because I want to completely rethink the mental health system. Whoa, what does that mean? 
how do we completely rethink the mental health system? We've been talking for years, years and years and years and years and years about parity, right? That we should be able to access our mental health and behavioral health system at the same level and capacity as our physical health system. And yet, we treat mental health on a crisis by crisis basis. Let me ask you a question. Let's say we only treated heart disease, high blood pressure, on a crisis by crisis basis. If I asked all of you to give up, how many of you, I, you don't have to answer. I am on high blood pressure medication because apparently I have a stressful job, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm gonna just give up that high blood pressure medication. If I have a heart attack, we'll deal with it. How does that work? Does that work well? Let's think about polio. Let's say we didn't come up with a medication or a vaccine, and we all still lived in iron lungs, because we'd all be living in the iron lungs now. Is that the best way to treat it? We go to a doctor every single year. Hopefully, all of you go every single year. I see a little smirk on the face there, so I'm hoping you're all going every single year to learn how our systems are functioning and what we might be able to do better. Maybe we need to lose a little bit of weight. Maybe we need to take, my cholesterol went up, my blood pressure went up this year, I'm also finally on the outside of cancer, right? So I had uterine cancer that was diagnosed in after my first year in, in the legislature. So for the last couple of years, I've been going through uterine cancer. But I'm f clean and healthy, and I feel better than I felt in years and years and years. Because I go to the doctor every year, and I take seriously what my doctor tells me. If I go to the hospital, which has happened to me because of my cancer and because of my treatments, et cetera, the first question I always get is who's your primary care provider? What if they also asked you, who's your primary mental health provider or behavioral health provider? This year, I am asking insurance companies to finally, truly, in my mind, meet the level of parity by covering a 60 minute, 60, 60 minute annual mental health exam with a qualified mental health provider. Think about it for a second. Imagine I'm pregnant. I'm not, I have no uterus. We discussed this already. But imagine for a moment that I'm pregnant. When I was pregnant in my ninth month, as we have a lovely pregnant woman here, when I was pregnant in my ninth month, I had already picked out my primary care provider for the baby. Not knowing anything about the baby, but I sat down with a, 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 a pediatrician. He told me what to expect at labor. He told me he would come visit in the hospital, and he did all of those things, and he was Unbelievable, his name is Dr. Michael Malopsky. This was 18 years ago, if you ever need a pediatrician, Dr. Michael Malopsky is unbelievable. So, imagine at that same time, I pick out my child's primary mental health provider, who conveniently is co-located in my doctor's office. <coughs> who conveniently, since they are co-located in my doctor's office, has communicated and collaborated with my doctor, so they are on the same insurance plans. And I sit down for 60 minutes before that baby is born, and I say, tell me what to expect. How do I keep my child healthy mentally? What are the things that I need to know about interacting with my baby so they feel safe? Why is swaddling important to the baby's mental health? These are conversations we're not having. So we are not setting up from the start a mentally healthy individual. Now let's move up to middle school. This child's gotten enough care, and all of the sudden, hormones. Everything's changing in my body. I don't understand anything. I'm really stressed out and I hate my parents. I hate every adult. Nobody understands me. Except for this woman or man that I have been seeing since I was a baby who I'm gonna check in with every year, who's gonna ask me when I'm 12 years old, 
How's your body feel? How's that impacting the way you're feeling? How's your stress and anxiety? Sorry, I hit the microphone. How's the stress and anxiety? What are the things that you're doing to calm yourself down? How are your relationships with your peers? You getting along okay? Maybe we can talk about some tips for how to talk about that one kid who you feel like is bullying you. And guess, get this, get this. My children are 17, 18, and 25. He's my stepson. I can't remember what, how old he is right now. 23, 24, 25. Somewhere in there. He just had a baby, made me a grandmother. This is where you say, ah, the youngest grandmother I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh. <laughs> yes, it's true. It's true. Please, please, please. Yeah. Um, but my 17 and 18-year-old, I still go in with them when they see their pediatrician on their request. So imagine we have this relationship with the mental health provider as well. I was chair of the school safety interim committee. I cannot tell you how many parents of children who commit violent acts in school say I had no idea my son was struggling. It's generally a boy. I had no idea they were struggling. Yeah, but you knew that they had acne on their back because you went to the appointment where the doctor said, well, a little bit of that derma scrub is going to work. Imagine you're going every year to sit down and having these conversations. And I believe that the, the perfect person, I used to work um, in Denver Health, and, and everybody knows that I'm, a, I'm a, a lover of social workers. I believe social workers and, and counselors, but the, the social work community, they're the front line. So when I worked at Denver Health, we talked about the right level of care at the right place at the right time. So what's the right level of care if you haven't been diagnosed with a significant mental illness? Well, a social worker is really trained to help you learn all of these life skills to better go through life. And a social worker is also trained to know if maybe you need a higher level of care. Right now, we talk about the dearth of psychologists and psychiatrists in our system? Well, guess what? Psychologists are treating a lot of people they don't need to be treating. Where social workers would be the absolute right person. And if we diversify our system better, the right people will be seen by the right professionals. And if we get into the habit of every year checking in with our mental health provider, Social worker, nurse practitioner, maybe if I'm suffering with addiction, it's an addictions counselor, they are included in this, in this bill. That maybe I'm checking in every year and therefore I might not have that midlife crisis. The number one cause of death for our youth is suicide in Colorado. Yet the number one population that is dying by suicide our middle-aged men. And after that, it's our senior population. What? Not okay. But if we've been in the habit of having those appointments, then when we go to the Corvette dealer, we might call our regular person and say, hey, I'm at a Corvette dealer. I'm really struggling with money right now. Can you talk me off the ledge? <coughs> but you know who to call. Right now, we're telling people, you know what? You're doing OK right now. But if you get into a crisis, go to an emergency room. They'll give you a referral to a mental health provider who may or may not be the right fit for you, may or may not be on your insurance. And let me tell you, you know, as a person who has struggled with um, uh, massive depression, massive depressive disorder, because I suffered with um, uh, postpartum depression, and I had a number of incidences of this massive depression, so I am marked, labeled as someone who struggles with massive depressive disorder. That's a terrifying word. But if I'm in crisis, I can't date a therapist and figure out if they're the right one for me. But when I'm feeling well and I'm doing a wellness check, certainly, because you're going to now meet me 
in my best self. Imagine your therapist knowing you in your best self. Right now, our therapists only know us in our worst selves because we only get to them in crisis. And then they try to help us come back to a self they don't even know. Whereas if we're going every year, oh my God, I know Daphna. She's generally full of life, full of energy, easygoing. But when she can't get out of bed, that's not Daphna. Let's address this. And I know who to call because I've designated a primary mental health provider. So this is my big bill of the year. Um, I'm doing a whole number of other mental health bills um, and Mental Health Colorado is my biggest partner. There isn't a bill that I run that I don't call Lauren first and say, hey, what do you think? Um, help me find more hidden money, um, all, all the questions. And um, mostly they deal with youth, but this is a bill that I believe will be a sea change in how we do our wellness care. And we, God willing, when we pass this, we will be the first state to do so. Here's my presentation today. <laughs> Do you want me to take questions now or after Lauren speaks? Uh, what, uh, let's do it now. Okay. okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? I do. Yes. Uh, how come or why did you, in, in your early time, uh, thinking about mental uh, health, uh, well, pregnancy or even before pregnancy, what made you think of mental health? I think what, first of all, the, the postpartum depression is a terrifying thing, right? So my daughter was born and I started having scary thoughts, which I will not repeat. Um, I was terrified by them. I was terrorized by them. Um, I was in a not so stable marriage um, and I didn't know how to get care. Um, but I talked to my mother and my mother did know how to get care. And so I ended up getting the care that I needed. At that point, Personal. yeah. At that point, um, you know, this is, we're talking 18, 19 years ago, now our pediatricians ask questions of the mother in all throughout the first year, I believe, um, to, to check for postpartum depression. We know that it is prevalent and we know that it is entirely manageable if we are to be able to diagnose it. So depression has been something that has been you know, something that I have understood in the system, but not until I was a parent did I desperately want to fight to fix the system because I understood how, how it's not serving our needs. And quite frankly, from an economic perspective, crisis management is exceptionally expensive. So when we talk about the fact that we don't have enough money in behavioral health care, well, duh, because we're serving it on a crisis by crisis management. We're constantly putting out a fire. We have to get ahead of it. And once we get ahead of it, and I've asked the insurance companies, because I've told the insurance companies, I want them to love this bill so much that they call the press conference. That's what I want. And, and I'm hoping that I get there. I don't know if I will. <laughs> I don't know. It's going to take a lot of convincing. Um, maybe a little, you know, no. Anyway, um, so that's, that's where it came from. Thank you so much. Yes. I love this bill, by the way. Thank you. But um, my question is, how would this apply when you have a young person now that is already in the crisis? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this, this piece of the law doesn't specifically apply to someone who's already in crisis. We have other pieces of law that are put into place to support our youth who are going through crisis already. This is trying to get ahead of, that, of, of the system. If you're struggling with a youth who's in crisis, I do encourage you to reach out, though. We have so many resources um, in, in our office that we have learned throughout the process that are, that are statewide services and resources. In your office? Mm -hmm. Information about. We don't treat. We have information. And so you could just reach out to Megan, and she will let, make let sure. Let me add that, that we will work with Megan uh, and uh, a follow-up. Uh, this, this afternoon with, uh, with the links and that sort of thing. So, yeah, you don't have to take... Yeah, uh, yeah and then you. Mm -hmm. 
So I just started my uh, health literacy, uh, my NGO. Yes. Just, just started it now. Which is Congratulations. About, uh, thank you. Which is about health literacy. And because I did a, a research in, master, in my master about health literacy in Colorado, and the results was <laughs> not uh, encouraging. Um, they were low, and there are no programs. Uh, no, there are some programs, but not enough uh, to cover a lot of subjects. So the health literacy level is not high. And because I came here to the U.S. like almost 10 years ago, and I was like, everything was new for me. I, I knew how hard it is to. So I thought that this problem is mostly maybe in the immigrant and the refugees communities, but I found out no. It is with all the American society, they have, many people have low level of health literacy and it is not always related to educational level. Sometimes it is, but not always. So I thought to start this NGO. So I don't know if you have this um, part in your fight for mental health, like the health, the health literacy thing for mental, even spread the word. I mean, like yep, so last year, um, I passed House Bill 19-1120. Look it up. So it's if to find it, it's leg.colorado.gov slash bills, plural, B-I-L-L-S. Yep, leg.colorado.gov slash bills, B-I-L-L-S slash HB 19 dash 1120 dash 1120 that's the recipe so if you want to look up a specific bill it's leg.colorado.gov slash bills slash bill number don't forget to put the the starting house and the year so HB 19 dash 1120 specifically youth mental health we set up an entire library that is where we set funds aside for an entire library in the Colorado Department of Education so that we can start teaching mental health literacy wherever health classes are taught. So if you are in kindergarten, age appropriate, if you are in kindergarten and you are learning about your body, then you would also be required to teach about your mind. Um, if you are in middle school and you're learning about not, um, uh, if you're learning about how to take care of your body, then you'll also have to be taught about how to take care of your mind. So um, uh, we will probably do an article to follow up on, on how that's going because there's been, there was a Colorado Public Radio article uh, that came out a couple days ago about challenges with implementation of the law because it's great that we pass a law um, and then we find out people are just ignoring said law, which it might be happening right now. Now I have to pass another law to not allow them to ignore the law. Um, but we have to pay attention to what's going on. So it's not enough that we pass a law. So if there is a bill that you're getting behind, I don't care what area it is in, great that you passed it, but you, you have to do the follow-up work afterwards to make sure it's being implemented and being adopted. I'm asking in my big bill that I told you about, I'm asking for a sea change, like completely different. One, one more question, and then we need to shift. You painted us a picture of how it could be that you, in the same building, you go to your primary and then to your mental health uh, physician. I was thinking, I'm curious what do you think about universal health care, because matching up those, uh, those uh, uh, insurance plans is a major... He just asked a very light question, very light question. Um, we'll need a whole nother couple of hours. Um, I, I will tell you in brief that I am very concerned that everybody should be, have access to quality health care um, and how we get there. I don't, I don't know at this point, right? We're not going to state by state necessarily get to that universal health care, but we are doing everything we can to make sure that Medicaid is expansive enough that people can be covered. We did expand Medicaid in Colorado to, to increase the number of people who are covered by our policies, and we will continue to do that. Um, I ring the bell every time a deadline is coming up to apply for Medicaid um, in case people aren't aware, and I'm doing what it is that I can do to make sure that everyone is covered. And it's a much longer conversation and a worthwhile one to have at another time.
So my name is Lauren Snyder. I'm the State Policy Director with Mental Health Colorado. We are a statewide nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan advocacy organization. We advocate on behalf of individuals with a <coughs> mental health or substance use condition throughout the state. Um, and I'm here to talk about some more obscure things. When I was approached, I kind of thought of what do you not always hear about that are gaps in our system? So things that you don't always hear about um, that I think are pressing, pressing issues for our state in regards to mental health and substance use. So I think um, a lot of you may have heard of our opioid epidemic that we're going through as a state and as a nation, but there's uh, another drug that actually is impacting um, more individuals in our state uh, in a big way, and that's methamphetamines. So I wanted to talk a little bit about methamphetamine use in Colorado, and then <clears throat> also talk a little bit, Mental Health Colorado is championing a bill this year uh, trying to defelonize symptoms of mental health conditions, um, and wanted to talk just a little bit about the criminalization of mental health and other health conditions in Colorado. So um, kind of two different topics, but... Um, so methamphetamines, you may not know, but they actually started similar to how the opioid epidemic started. Um, they were first created in Japan and started to be used widely in Colorado or in the United States in the 1940s um, as actually a treatment for certain mental health conditions, such as depression and other things. Um, they were actually given pretty widely to our troops in World War II, and then we started to realize that they were actually causing some pretty serious harm to individuals. And so uh, in the beginning of the 60s, they, um, methamphetamine use and production went underground. Um, it's still available widely, um, at least amphetamines are, through things like Adderall. Uh, but there is a methamphetamine, um, I guess, prescription drug available still today, uh, though not widely prescribed. Uh, so what is methamphetamine? Um, it's a stimulant drug that impacts your nervous system uh, and your dopamine system in, in your brain. So those things that um, help process thoughts and emotions and your movement um, your, um, in your brain as well as the pleasure centers in your brain. Usually we have low um, kind of uh, everyday utilization of our dopamine system when you eat a really nice um, dinner, a nice Italian dinner, and you, it feels good, you release dopamines, and it, make you, it makes you feel good. Um, that's on a very small state scale. Uh, even when you use prescription opioids, that releases about uh, 600, if you see a little bit over 600 um, kind of levels of dopamine in your brain. Uh, every time you use methamphetamine use, it's almost doubled. So it's one of the highest dopamine releasing um, drugs out there. If you do that over and over and over again, it totally destroys your, your dopamine system. And so um, what does that look like in your brain? This image on the top left shows uh, kind of your normal, uh, I guess, brain imaging of your dopamine system. Um, heavy use on the far right. Um, it totally wrecks your, your dopamine system. And it also impacts other things such as your motor skills. So showing the loss of your dopamine receptors leads to lower ability to have um, um, overall motor skills or memory, memory skills. Um, those are important later. Remember, motor skills, memory skills all, all get depleted with long-term meth use. Um, this bottom left one, though, is where I wanted to focus because that impacts what we do policy-wise. So control group, that's your dopamine system on the left, functioning pretty well. Um, the middle picture is somebody who's just starting recovery after long-term methamphetamine use. Um, you can see that their dopamine system is pretty damaged. Even after 14 months in recovery, 14 months of abstinence, not using any type of methamphetamine or other drugs, it's just starting to come back. Who knows anybody that has entered a drug treatment or recovery program that is 14 months long? It just doesn't exist. We are setting up individuals for a failure when we expect them to get better in three months. Because their brains have not even begun to heal. Not even close. And we set them up, we get them treatment, and then go be well and just expect for greater results. And it, does, it doesn't happen. 
our brain science shows that it doesn't happen. So what do we need to do? Um, I guess before I go into that, I'll show you just kind of the prevalence data. So alcohol continues to be the number one admission for um, substance use treatment in the state. It is by far the number one issue. It kills the most people in our state. The second is methamphetamine use. And then the third is opioids. All of our federal dollars, though, are all going to opioid treatment, which is understandable. I'm not saying that it shouldn't, but we don't talk about this number. We don't talk about these 10,000 people that are getting admitted each year. If you look at um, issues around the state, so this is drug treatment admissions in different regions of the state. Other than the southeast and Denver, methamphetamine use is the second highest treatment admission across the state. If you look at northeastern Colorado, where methamphetamine use is a huge issue, it's equal to that of, it's a 273 admissions in 2018, and they had 273 alcohol admissions. So it's a huge, huge issue, especially in our rural parts of the state. Um, again, just some more information about um, methamphetamine and other drug treatment admissions. This is the public system. This doesn't include the private system, just so you know. So barriers to recovery. So images like this, um, this used to be how we talked about individuals with a, a health condition, with addiction issues. Um, this is society's idea of what a quote unquote meth addict looks like. These are human beings. If you had a meth addiction, imagine seeing a billboard like that. Would it make you want to go in to get treatment? Probably not. This is not how people identify with themselves. And so I think we need to flip the conversation about how we talk about addiction, especially how we talk about meth addiction. Um, there's also a lot of stigma, even in our healthcare system, about how we treat individuals with a methamphetamine addiction. Oftentimes, methamphetamine addiction can look like psychosis. It can look like a lot of things that um, don't attribute it to a normal health condition. So. Um, I think that's one of the barriers is just overall stigma around methamphetamine use. And then also when we talk about our treatment. Oops. Um, we don't realize that people have damaged their brains when we talk about treatment for methamphetamine use. So not only is treatment not very, it's not long enough, we also are not understanding that individuals have totally wrecked their reward system. So normal treatment and intensive treatment does not work the same way. And so Mental Health Colorado this year presented to the Opioid Interim Committee to plead with them, it's not just opioids, we need to talk about other treatment options that are available for individuals that don't just have an opioid treatment or an opioid addiction, that we need long-term care and that we need insurers to cover that long-term care, um, that there needs to be step-down options, that somebody can't just leave residential and go out in the community without any step-down options available to them. So, um, and then stigma, we need to talk about addiction in a different way. So that's um, my little briefer on methamphetamine use. It's something I'm very passionate about um, that I hope the legislature and individuals start talking a lot more about because it is widespread uh, and it is a huge issue in Colorado and across the nation. Uh, okay, so the second thing I wanted to talk about was around just the overall criminalization of mental health conditions and substance use conditions in our state. Um, in Colorado, a person is with a serious mental health condition is four times more likely to go to jail than an inpatient setting. Four times more likely to go to jail. Um, that number is astounding to me. Um, those who have mental health conditions are likely to be incarcerated longer than individuals who don't have a health condition. Um, they are also found to be charged with a rule violation two times more likely than the general population. Half of all of Denver County jails has somebody in there currently, so half of all inmates in Denver County jails have a mental health condition, such as psychosis or depression. Um, they're likely to stay in Denver County jail 30 days longer than their peers, and 85% of inmates who assaulted a deputy we're on an active mental health alert. We knew they came in with a mental health condition and they assaulted a deputy. And in our laws currently, that's a felony charge, punishable three to five years in prison. 
that is what Mental Health Colorado is trying to focus on this year, is our specific laws that are disproportionately impacting individuals with mental health conditions. So like Representative Michelson Janae said, we've set up our system where we are only responding to individuals in a crisis. To take that a step further, when we are responding to them, it's usually somebody with a, with a gun and a badge, not somebody who's trained in mental health. When, say, somebody who is experiencing psychosis or has a delusional or something like that, interacts with a law enforcement officer, perhaps assaults them or being restrained and assaults them, again, that's a felony assault. Punishable, three to five years in prison. We are hoping with the bill this year to specifically address those instances where first responders are assaulted and make specific exceptions for individuals who are, we've already noticed that they're on a mental health, con have a mental health concern. So somebody who's on an M1 hold, a 72 hour mental health hold that goes into an emergency room, they assault a nurse. Why are we charging them with felony charges? We know that they have a mental health condition. We understand that they have some type of, they're either gravely disabled or they have, uh, they're a danger to themselves or others. So we're trying to move that down to a misdemeanor charge. Uh, if you, we have a, a big issue right now in the state where there's a backlog for individuals who are incompetent to proceed. So I'm brought in on a charge and um, I'm in jail. I don't understand who the, the, my public defender is. I don't understand the charges against me. I don't understand who the, the, uh, the judge is. That means I can't move forward with my trial because I can't actively participate in my own trial because I don't even understand the charges against me. There are hundreds of people who are waiting currently for services who are already found incompetent to proceed and they're racking up charges. They're racking up these felony charges just sitting in jail without any services. It's a huge issue in the state. So this bill would also impact individuals who um, are found incompetent to proceed to make sure that we're not unduly charging them with felony after felony after felony while they wait to get mental health services. To illustrate this, I have a, a, a brainwave member, so it's somebody who uh, advocates with us. Uh, his son was picked up on shoplifting charges at El Paso County. His son was brought in, his dad found out, called the jail, pled with them. My son has a mental health condition. He's been on an M1 in the last year. He needs medication. If he doesn't get medication, I'm nervous about what's gonna happen. Five days later, his son assaulted a jail guard and was put in solitary confinement for seven months. While he was in solitary confinement, he picked up two more felony charges because it's a felony to assault somebody who works at a jail. So he has three felony charges now in addition to shoplifting and had to wait to go to the Mental Health Institute. By the end of his sentence, uh, well, end of his incompetency, he had five felony charges because of this enhanced sentencing law. And we had already noticed that he had mental health. So I, that's just a very short way of saying policies matter. There is very much stigma that is inherent in our state law, and it just makes it harder for individuals who have specific health conditions this law doesn't impact just people with mental health conditions. We include IDD there, individuals with an intellectual or developmental disability, individuals with uh, dementia. We're hearing more and more are going to the criminal justice system instead of the healthcare system. Um, so I think, long story short, um, how we treat individuals in our policies and in our state law really do make a difference. And so uh, that bill's not introduced yet, but. If you're interested, I'm happy to send it out to you once it is uh, and would love your support. Uh, or if you would like more information, I'm happy to send it. Um, that's, that's it for me. Any questions? Sounds like you really have your hands full. You know. <laughs> and that's an <laughs> understatement. But I, guess, I guess I'm always curious about what leads people to get into meth in the first place. Is there a socioeconomic lack of access to mental health, all those issues that I guess on the prevention side, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe that's that's kind of off your topic, but I'm always curious. What no, I think that's I think that's great. I mean, those pictures that used to be like 
how they tried to, it was a prevention campaign, scare people away from using methamphetamine. It's a very powerful drug and it creates a very powerful high. So a lot of people become, go down the road of addiction first time they try it. Uh, so I think it's, it's one of those issues around prevention is just making sure that it's not even really an option anymore for individuals. Yeah. There's science we should be looking for, or I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the science usually with methamphetamine use is going to be a little bit irritable, uh, high energy, right? It's a stimulant drug. Weight loss. Um, yes, for serious use, teeth decay. It um, tends to have more, create more saliva creation in your mouth, which can rot some of your teeth. Uh, skin picking, because open wounds, your skin actually becomes a little bit thinner, I believe. I don't know, I'm not a clinician. Um, so those types of things, um, overall withdraw from relationships, I think overall. Um, any, th any advice on how to make sure they don't get there in the first, you know, try it in the first place? I, that's kind of an open-ended question. Yeah, I think just having a conversation and not being scared of it. Um, but I don't, that's what I would want from my parents is just a conversation about it and giving outlets in other ways for our kids to interact. Yeah, so sorry, one more quick way. Do schools have programs as far as warnings and, and issues and part of their mental health program, high schools, you know, along with all the other? Not uniform throughout the state. I think that's why we're seeing more rural schools It pop up in more rural areas. Um, it's not as big of an issue in Denver area, metro area, but our rural areas are struggling with methamphetamine use. So, okay, thank you. Is it really true that you can get addicted the first time? Uh, and I'm asking this specifically because that phrase was part of scare campaigns throughout the history of, of trying to get people not to use drugs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's usually been a lie, uh, and uh, youngsters especially are... are I have good bullshit detectors. <laughs> yeah. And they'll say oh, it's just propaganda, just like these billboards you pointed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, again, I'm not a clinician, but um, when you look at the dopamine levels that are being released when you use meth for the first time, it's like the best high you've ever had, right? It's the best you've ever felt ever, um, whether that translates to addiction, but it may lead to... I want to feel that good again because I could have as many great Italian dinners and I'm never going to feel that good again, right? Like that's the thought behind it, is wanting to feel that excitement and happiness and dopamine release again. Maybe we should encourage them to have sex. <laughs> are, are there other states or even countries that do a good job in this area with their laws and their procedures? So uh, for at least decriminalization or defelonization of mental health, there's a lot internationally. Portugal is looked at as a model. Um, there's a number of other states, Connecticut, um, South Dakota, strangely, that actually makes specific exemptions for individuals with health conditions in their sentencing laws. Um, so recognizing that if you have an intellectual or developmental disability or a mental health condition, that the judicial system should be taking that into account. So there are other states that we're looking at. Um, and just looking at the, this enhanced sentencing law, it's not helping anybody. It's not keeping first responders safe at all, more safe, I guess, um, that assaults on healthcare workers are actually going up. Tim, you're back. Yeah, um, uh, two questions on, on men. How would you restructure the prevention campaign? The hopefully be more positive, yet more effective. Mm -hmm. And on decrim, how, uh, laws aside, how do you physically protect first responders or, or a justice system so, sure. so that works? So part of the bill for decriminalization is we are requiring all health care facilities, so nursing homes, hospitals, um, uh, jails that have health clinics within them, to all create violence prevention plans that are done with the frontline staff. So having your emergency room nurses make a plan about what they think is going to keep them safe and making those facilities update those uh, annually so that if it's, is it ratios? I've heard of some 
mental health facilities that have like one clinician to 10 individuals who are on long-term certifications that are all supposed to have one-on-one -on -one treatment so people are sleeping in the hallways. Like, what, what is going to keep them safe? Uh, I think for law enforcement, there's a lot of things we can look at. Co-responders, crisis intervention training, de-escalation techniques. There's a lot of training and supports that we can provide to first responders so that Right, a police officer isn't trained to deal with somebody who's in a mental health crisis. Why should we expect there to be any other type of response than what's currently happening? That's not in their training. So getting individuals who are trained to deal with an individual in crisis, uh, I think is a great way uh, to handle it. As far as methamphetamine use, um, most of my recommendations are on the treatment side. So right, making sure we're getting people long enough treatments so that they don't, um, we're not setting them up for failure. Um, prevention techniques though, I think it's just, um, I'd have to do a little bit more research. We haven't as an organization done a whole lot around prevention with specific to methamphetamine use other than finding what's, what's not working and the scare techniques isn't really working very well. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, a third resource person that I just met uh, a few few minutes ago, or before our uh, 1.30 uh, began, uh, Baboud George Matthew, who is uh, uh, the Vice President of the Board of NAMI, uh, to say a little bit about the, the kinds of resources that NAMI can, can bring mm -hmm. to this issue. Thank you, David, for that. Um, yeah, um, it's a pleasure to be here and a privilege to be here. And um, Daphna, thank you for that powerful presentation. I hope we can get behind you, Paul, as well. Um, that's a slight correction. We have uh, uh, Margaret here, uh, who has been uh, president. And this, just this Saturday, I've been elected as the president of the state unit. So I'm uh, from vice president. I'm transitioning into this role from Saturday on. So <clears throat> thank you. And uh, yeah, let me start with what the question you asked about why people go to MEPS. Uh, one thing that we always say is that people go to these things. They are self-medications for people. That points to the fact how much we should be concentrating on mental health. You cannot be talking about homelessness or substance abuse or poverty without talking about mental health. So it has to be an integrated approach that we should have for our legislature, for our medical community, mental health community, and the social uh, fabric of our community. So I'm personally involved with a huge outreach from last year to the interfaith communities to talk about how relevant it is to talk about mental health and how they should be integral partners of this approach because every Weekend, we all have different kinds of spirituality, and that's very personal for us. But that leads us, that gives us hope. And without hope, that's the end of life. So we are trying to, to, to promote that awareness to say that people who are invisible, who are in the trenches, are there because it's not their fault. We need to affirm to the each one of them, that they matter in our community, and that we see them, and then we will walk alongside them. That's the responsibility of the communities that we have. Families come first, communities come first, and your spirituality come together. Therapy and medications are just this much of the total journey to wellness. So it's a question of having the community come together to do this work. NAMI does a lot of programs. We have been here uh, for the last 40 years. We have programs, we have education programs, we have support programs for both peers and families. We have huge advocacy thing, and uh, Mental Health Colorado and NAMI could be defined as maybe twins in this. So, it's a question where we cannot be working in silos anymore because the stakes are too high. This is an epidemic. So we need to get together, not just Mental Health Colorado or NAMI or similar organizations. And um, we 
have to come together. All this needs money, like Daphne said. But we can find money, we should find money to support these programs. Uh, it's up to us. It's what is stake, at stake is our next generation. Let us save lives, because one suicide is one too many. I just um, heard last week on the 4th of uh, um, January, a 10th grader died by suicide in Legacy High School. It should not happen. We should not lose a child to that. So uh, um, and let me cut it short. Look, uh, we have programs, and for any program we have uh, that we offer the educational support or advocacy, or we have presentations that we take to the schools. So for NGOs like yours, so call us. We will be happy to come there and do our presentations. So go to namicoordinator.org, and then we, and I'll call if I'll give you my card. So, but that's very, uh, a key thing in, in our approach to this. We should save lives here and now, not after life. This is a calling for all of us. That's what NAMI stands for. Um, all our programs over the last four, 40 years have been evidence-based programs. And we offer to every community free of cost. But um, we are about to ask people that while we offer free programs to the community, you also should keep at the back of your mind that all these programs cost money as well, like every program that a mental health coordinator does. So community has to come together, support those of us who are doing this work on the field. I'm here standing not as the president of NAMI Colorado. I'm here stand, standing as a dad who has learned the possibility of wellness over the last 10 years. It took me five years to make sense of what my only child, my daughter, who she's 35, is going through. But she's a person who has, talk about the possibilities, who has gone through the graduate school at DU and done her master's in social work after therapy. So it is possible. Wellness is possible. And we're not talking about total cure about, about anything. We cannot talk about cure for diabetes. It, it happens, it, it, it goes through your lifetime of cancer. Similarly, this is a disease of the brain. Last time I checked, brain was still a part of the body. <laughs> so let us do this together. And uh, that's what NAMI stands for. And uh, all of us put the hard work on the field. So thank you very much. Thank you, David, for giving me. Yeah.